I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. So I'm really happy to have Maria Popova. Is that how you say your last name, Maria? Yep. I'm really happy to have Maria on the show. Maria, I have to tell you, this is totally just a selfish podcast for me because <laughs> the old, people always ask me what blogs I read. And I'm always happy to tell people what books I read, but I'm always hesitant to say what blogs I read because A, I don't want to insult anybody and B, I don't want people to stop reading my blog. But the only blog I read <laughs> is your blog, which is oh, brainpickings.org. So awesome. Thank you. But you don't think that the um, book authors would be insulted by not being uh, included in your selections? <laughs> I, you know, people are insulted for all sorts of reasons. But really, like, for instance, I write every morning and I know you write every day, all day. And some, I often look to what I'm reading for inspiration. So usually I'm reading books, but I sometimes I need to read other stuff to get inspiration and on that list is brainpickings.org because you always have inspiring articles to to draw from they're either about creativity or life or whatever and so just the work you do is, is phenomenal and i selfishly wanted to do this podcast so i could learn more about the work you do <laughs> well i i very much believe that any good creative work is a selfish act primarily so uh <laughs> I think everything we read, all the books we admire came out of that. So ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, let me let me ask you about that because – so you don't, you don't write personal stories about yourself, but you write uh, in, in-depth analysis um, and it's almost like your website is a, a museum of the world but on the internet. So you write all about great literature, great art, great design – um, all of these things that have inspired you through the years. And do you find that to be in any way, um, you know, like, like you say, art is, or re- writing is to some degree almost narcissistic. Like you think you're writing because other people are going to be interested in what you have to say. So do you mm, find that a no, little bit? That's not, that's not really why I write. I mean, for me personally, I can only obviously speak for myself, but, um, I do think, I I guess a selfish act is not, perhaps not the right language, but a very personal act, even if I don't write personal stories. And I I like the idea of of a museum of the world, as you say, but it's really kind of a museum of my inner world. And the only common thread between all the things that I write about, whether it's art or philosophy or science, is that there's some 
element in there that helps me, the person, figure out how to live and how, how, to, how to live a, a meaningful life. And that's the impulse. And, and the fact that or the, the possibility that it might be helpful to others or interesting to others, that's wonderful. And I'm very grateful for it. But that's not the, the, the motive. And I think that's really interesting because I would contrast that with almost all other – like 99.99% of writing on the internet, which is all this kind of uh, 10 ways to do – have a better interview at work or 10 ways to get a promotion or here's you know 10 photos of Kim Kardashian you missed last week. And none of this has kind of uh, – you know, you know, everybody's putting – sort of themselves on a pedestal. Like if I write 10 ways to uh, get a promotion at work, I hardly ever tell my own personal, like the writers of those articles hardly ever tell their own personal stories or give kind of uh, interesting examples. They just sort of give, sort of blurt out advice from a pedestal. And I don't really see that in your writing. Like you're really kind of, even though you're not writing personal stories, you're really writing um, your personal views of these works that you personally find either beautiful or meaningful or whatever. Well, thank you. First of all, that's very, very generous. But I also, I, I think those words, uh, beauty and meaning, they're so important and also so lacking in, in a lot of the commercial um, commercial media. And, and it's interesting, too, that I didn't hear you say the word content once, which is one of my big, big pet peeves, because I do think there's a difference between content, which is the kind of stuff you see in those listicles and whatnot, and substantive writing, which is with what people who write for their own benefit and, and by extension for the public benefit do. And I actually think, you know, language really matters and how we think about those things matters. And that explains why there are all these sort of qualitative differences. And I don't think what I do is any is better or special or different from what anybody else could do. It's more of partly a function of, well, a function of the fact that I, you know, I've been doing this for now more than eight years. And I made very early on a decision not to, to have a commercial ad supported site. And I think ad supported media do produce content and not substantive writing because that word is something primarily used by sort of people in marketing and native advertising who treat quote unquote content as this filler material that transmits the true currency of their trade, which is advertising. And then, you know, we will hear this cliche content is king and it's mostly a cliche, you know, used by those people. But in that context, content is not king content is currency and substantive writing is king in the sense of that's what really nourishes us and inspires us and, and just makes us feel a little more alive you know and, and and I think it's very hard to conceive of any self-respecting journalist or scholar or writer of integrity who would stand to call his or her work content and I think as long as we continue to kind of falsely crown currency and to insult substantive writing by calling it content will continue to have these listicles and these sort of vacant things and will continue to have a, a problem. Well, I, I, think, I think there's two aspects there. One is uh, the listicles, for better or for worse, are attractive to people because let's say you are at work in a cubicle and you want a promotion and someone's writing 10 ways you can get a promotion, you're probably going to click on that. Not because you're fooled by the listicle aspect of it, but because you don't, you're, you're, you're miserable in your life and you want a promotion and this person, whether he's correct or not, has at least held out the bait. Hey, if you click on this, I might be able to help you get a promotion. So that mm -hmm. might not be meaningful, you know, writing or whatever. And it might be used by some other organization's purposes as advertising, you know, to get advertising, but it holds out the bait that it might help the reader, whether it does or not, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I I think lists in general, listicles and lists are different things. Just the list as a sort of um, form of rhetoric is a powerful thing. And even Umberto Eco 20 years ago wrote that the list is the origin of culture. And he's famously a big list maker. And um, Susan Sontag, too, all her diaries. And she used to say that um, lists are how we sort of confer meaning on existence. And 
I get that they appeal to us because they make chaos or, or, or an overwhelming amount of, of material or information feel somewhat containable and digestible. And there is nothing wrong with that. But again, I think it, it's a qualitative difference that goes back to, as you say, is it really going to help the reader? Is, is there some sort of merit of substance behind the form? Even if it takes the form of a listicle, is there some deeper function or is it really a vehicle for, like you said, clickbait? You know, it's funny. One time I was um, backstage at a, on a news show and uh, the producer of the news show com- came up to me and basically said, uh, uh, we're just trying to fill the space between advertisements here. And, <laughs> and that well, was at least a new- she was honest or she was honest. <laughs> that, that was a news show at a major network. Like, uh, and it was a major news show. It was on, like, I believe from 7 to 8 p.m., so the time when people are watching news on that network. So, and that's how, that's how quote unquote content is delivered to the masses. So, what I like about, uh, brain pickings is you've sort of kind of curated what, and I can almost imagine what you must be feeling. Like, you see a book, and it might be anywhere from, 200 years old to one year old, you see a book or you see some design or you see something that's kind of lighted your fancy a little bit and you decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to absorb this and focus on it and write about it in a way that is in fact entertaining to, to my readers. And I know you say you don't focus on the readers that much, but your writing is good enough that the readers are going to be entertained no matter what. So, so, and then what you pick, the choices you pick, you could see your, your joy in them. Uh, you know, every single day. And and there's no common theme really among them, I don't think. Would you say there's a common theme among what you write about? Um, theme in terms of subject, no, but theme in terms of, as I said, sort of motive or common thread, yeah, it's sort of this question of, of, of meaning and, and living a somewhat aspirational, ennobled life in, in our age of... <laughs> Cynicism, which, you know, cynicism is a very, I feel, very kind of lazy response to life in the sense that it's, it's, it's almost like, um, like a hedge against disappointment, you know, because when we're cynical and something bad happens, we're like, oh, okay, well, I knew that was going to happen. Well, obviously, or, you know, this person's an idiot or whatever the case may be, but it's a, it's a self-protection mechanism that we have that is very much reinforced by the culture in which we live. But I don't think that it is a useful one in the end, in the grand scheme of things. And I guess that is the common thread that I, I very much believe in. And just, you know, <laughs> earnestness. We have no tolerance for earnestness. We mock it and deride it in, in ourselves. We're so uh, embarrassed about it and ashamed of it. But or, or, it or, or, or we could be using it as an excuse. So the reason why we want to be cynical is we can say, well, look, I'm not going to try to quote unquote or get that promotion or get or start that business or write that book because uh, everybody, the, the government's against me or Wall Street's against me or some mysterious they are against mm-hmm. me. So there's no point in me trying to step outside myself and be better, be the best person I can be. Exactly. No, that's part of the laziness of it, the sense of resignation. Um, and I, I think the, the other side of the same coin is also our sort of very conflicted relationship with our most earnest aspirations, because I think, and, and I would say pretty much any, every philosopher in the history of humanity believes that, that every human being on some level just wants to be happy, seeks happiness. But the ironic thing, my God, is that like you cannot be, you cannot pursue happiness without acknowledging that this in and of itself is a very earnest, very deep aspiration. And, and, and people are scared of pursuing it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, so 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 I want to so I want to get I want to reel it back a little bit and get to your origin story because every every superhero has a secret origin story and. <laughs> So, so you started brain pickings in in two thousand six. W- where were you working then? Like, what was happening? I was a sophomore in college. I had uh, come to college to, to a, a pretty fancy school. So I'd come from Bulgaria, from the ninety nine percent of Bulgaria, which are you know not quite the ninety nine percent of America. To, it, it, to is there one percent in Bulgaria? 
Well, the thing is, I mean, I grew up when while Bulgaria was still under communism and communism sort of fell in 91 ish. Um, and, and in a communist society, there is no 1%. And so even though by the time I graduated high school and was about to come to college, um, it was allegedly democracy, it was decades of that sort of social structure trying to be um, rebuilt. And I wouldn't say, I think one thing that happened was that there was a very rapid rift between the, the sort of the haves and the have-nots. And what did emerge in Bulgaria at the time I was a teenager and in high school was, was a 1% class that was mostly the mafia, uh, the product of extreme corruption. Bulgaria, unfortunately, is still one of the most corrupt countries in, in well, if not the most corrupt country in the European Union. Um, and so, yeah, there, basically, yes, there was a 1%, but my family was like <laughs> as removed from it as, as they come. Uh, so in any case, so, so, how, so did, how did you, how were you able to afford to kind of get over from Bulgaria to a, a nice school here in the U.S.? Well, I didn't afford it. I mean, I applied and I, I got in, uh, but I did work for jobs during college to pay my way through. And I had some sort of, I, I guess it was some sort of like a name scholarship, which means that it was from an individual person that was like donating money to international students. So it was a small scholarship. Um, and then the rest of it, I just, you know, had some loans and did four jobs, two work study jobs, two other jobs just to pay through. And the interesting thing that happened was I didn't anticipate. I mean, you know, we think American culture is so pervasive in the world and that somehow because we watch all the movies and the, just it's in the culture that we're prepared for it. But I did feel very kind of disconnected, I guess. And I didn't at the time realize it was because the school I was in, which was, you know, an Ivy League school with a lot of rich kids, was not representative of what we would call America by and large, you know. And I just didn't, I was very, I was very unhappy. And uh, so I had two kind of, two impulses to really start brain pickings. One was that the smaller one, I would say, was that I one of the jobs that I had was at this little agency that um, was seven guys who were very young, idealistic. They only wanted to work with brands that sort of had an element of kindness and did something good in the world. And I wanted to sort of participate in that and, and help them. And, and I wanted to start something that countered this approach to creativity as something that only takes from within its own field. So in their case, they would sort of circulate all that um, stuff from the communication arts industry, their industry, and, and for inspiration, you know, around the office of sort of forwards. And I intuited, and at the time, I didn't have the language for it or, or the sort of formal foundation for it, but I had a deep sense that, no, actually, the most creative work comes when we take all these very disparate ideas from different fields and different eras and you know sensibilities and we we combine them in unusual ways and so that was part of it that I wanted to start a little packet of inspiration that was of this um, ethos but the more important thing I think for me was that I was not um, satisfied with my actual education in school and I didn't feel that the 400 person lecture hall with the professor reading off a PowerPoint slide in the front without knowing a single person's name in her class. You know, I don't, I didn't feel stimulated by that. And mostly I wanted to be taught how to live. I mean, that's was, was perhaps my naive expectation that college would teach me, but instead I was being taught how to memorize and how to take standardized tests. And at the same time, even when I was able to wiggle my room uh, my, my way into the occasional sort of philosophy seminar or something in the humanities, even there, I would say higher education is very much based on this notion of learning and cultivating intelligence by learning how to tear things down, you know, how to, how to rip this argument to shreds. And even the, the whole paradigm of the college critical essay is criticism, but not Criticism in the sense of critical thinking that comes from science, which has an element of humility to it, almost acknowledging that we don't know everything and there's this sort of fruitful ignorance. But the, the kind of criticism that 
um, is about tearing arguments down has almost an arrogance and a self-righteousness to it. And I just thought, what's the point of that? Why not build things in the world as opposed to tear them down? And so I started basically just doing my own reading and seeking out things and ways of thinking and ideas that I felt were, were not that, were not the sort of seed of cynicism, which I do think higher education very much plants in people that were, that were generous and noble and, and meaningful, but not kind of foolish optimism, you know? And so... Well, why, do you, why do you think higher education has that kind of um, almost DNA in it to implant cynicism <laughs> in people? Well, I do think that that notion of the critical uh, training intelligence to be a way of showing off how well you can tear something down, like that's very much part of what we're taught to do and in writing papers and essays and and critiquing even each other in in class. That's what college does. And you can very easily see the sort of uh, repercussions in in the so-called real life and, you know, people coming out of school, becoming whatever they become. And you look today even at the Internet and everything's a takedown. Everything is this sort of undertone of snarky and sarcastic and that's part of it. And which is why also I I write a lot about books, but I get very antsy when people call it reviews because I I don't write reviews. I write very much sort of wholehearted recommendations. The the critical aspect is the review, the negative a review, you know, presumes that you point out the positive, but the negative also. And most, um, literary reviews are actually an exercise in how well and how intelligently one writer can eviscerate another, you know? And so I, I, I yeah. I, I, I totally agree with your approach because I think you take any book, someone has spent a year, two years, five years of their lives, uh, uh, writing that book. And then somebody can easily write a review, uh, in 20 minutes, t- trashing that book completely. And it's just, it's almost like a, a murder that has taken place. Like it's just a, a horrible thing. Yeah, there's thing. a violence to it. Yeah. And and I've I've you know I've gotten so many um, so many of the books that I've read over the past several years have been because of your uh, I don't want to say recommendations, but your analysis of these books. Uh, it's been really you, you've been uh, uh, the curator for for many of the books I've read over the past few years. Oh, well, thank you. You're I'm probably glad. you're probably the one person I know who's who reads more than me because I feel like I have to read a lot to write a little. Like if mm. I'm gonna, if I'm going to write two hours worth of stuff, I have to. It's almost like I have to read ten hours worth of books. So I always need good sources of good uh, uh, things to read. Yeah, no, I, I think reading, learning to read well and to write well is really learning to think well. And that's what we, we all sort of try to do, right? Well, so, okay. So now you're, you're, you're at this agency. You've been, did you, did you finish school? Did you drop out? Like what happened? Oh, no, I finished very reluctantly. I didn't, you know, it's funny. I was talking to a friend of mine recently about this, uh, who, a new friend who is, uh, his name is Parker Palmer. He's my grandmother's age and he's just, absolutely wonderful one of those people just you know emanating goodness and he went to school at berkeley in the 50s and sort of became disillusioned and we were just talking for the same reason basically the sort of cynical tearing down aspect and we were talking about it and i just had this epiphany i said to him you know i i I didn't it didn't occur to me that dropping out was an option i just i mean honestly i didn't even consider that that was uh, possible. I mean, the, in Bulgarian, there isn't even a word for a dropout. Like in, in <laughs> English, there's a word dropout. There's no such word in Bulgarian, at least that I know of. And it just, I, I guess I'm, I'm just a chronic finisher of things. And I didn't, I mean, had I even thought of it, I probably may have dropped out because I did see that a lot of the, that that track, that, that life path, you know, college spitting people out into this conveyor belt of you know, high end corporate jobs. And I, that never appealed to me. So that was certainly not the reason why I graduated. And, I, and meanwhile, I amassed all those, you know, student loans, and I was working so hard just to sort of stay in school that I just I mean, this was literally last week, last this week, then I was talking to Parker. And I was like, you know, 
I should have I should have thought of it. You yeah, know? you should have dropped I out because. Dropped out. Yeah. But but still, it's amazing. I mean, you know, it's clear. You know, one way or the other, you figured out how to make a living doing what you love. So, which many people don't because they're so scared of how are they going to pay their student loans. They don't take that chance. And maybe, you know, so let's, so let's, so let's figure out how you did that. So you're, so you're at the agency. They're all sending around emails and you, you're, t- you took a bigger picture view of that. So you started, I guess, sending around your own emails of what inspired you and what happened. So I went, uh, originally it started as just, uh, eight way, seven way email to the seven people at work and me that I would send every Friday. And it was literally just three links. There was no text. There was no nothing. It was three links to really interesting things that I thought were in some way, well, yeah, interesting and enriching and had nothing to do with their industry, the things from, you know, neuroscience and philosophy. And, um, there was no YouTube at the time or it had just started. Maybe I don't remember, uh, but like web videos maybe later on. And, uh, eventually it became, you know, three links and a sentence about each about why this is interesting. And then a link in a little paragraph. And then that became like a little article and what, what were some of the first things? What were some of the first things you were showing people that were inspiring to you? I mean, I obviously I was in my early twenties. I've changed a lot as a person, but you know, there's a there's a kind of excitedness that we that that comes with a beginner's mind. So I think we all would discover something that we didn't know about, and for a while was sort of super into it and really obsessed and. And then it fades and then there's something else. And at the time, I was really interested in neuroscience and all the things coming out of um, especially how new studies with fMRI were attempting to illuminate how we think, but also showing or, or suggesting that we'll never quite be able to use pure biology to explain things that are of a more humanistic nature, things about emotions and motives. And I was just very interested in that. So I was sending a lot of neuroscience, behavioral economics, um, occasionally interesting art, sort of unusual art that I saw. It was very present based, I guess, early on, which is ironic because right now the majority of what I write about is very, very old. And I've gravitated more and more toward history, I guess, but really this notion of things that are timeless, but also very timely. And I think that that can only happen as you um, grow up. And I don't mean in age, but in in sensibility and you learn more and more and eventually come to realize that, well, actually, this brand new idea, um, Bertrand Russell had it a century ago or, you know, whatever the case may be. And well, it, so, yeah, it, it's funny because uh, I would say there's a common theme between that. And and even though what you write about now is totally different, you don't you don't write like, let's say yesterday, yesterday's news is what happened. But then there's this whole uh, that's the tip of the iceberg. And there's this whole body of things on how it happened. And you mm-hmm. often write about how something happened. So how, not just about a great work of art, but how did this great work of art happen? And, you know, that's why it, it seems like, you know, you have so many articles about, you know, all these great writers uh, talking about the writing process, as opposed to just talking about what they wrote. You, you write a lot about process and how one, any of your readers or you have become better writers by looking at all these different pieces of advice from these great writers. So so thinking about how things happen seems to be a common mm-hmm. theme in, in your work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I very much think that the process is a much greater reflection of personhood than than the product. And and Austin Kleon, who I know is, is um, you, yeah. you feature quite a lot on your blog, he yeah. often writes about how documenting the process is often as artistic as the outcome of the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, actually, this morning I was reading. Um, so John Steinbeck, while he was writing *Grapes of Wrath*, he actually wrote another equally important book, which was the journal of the writing of the book. And so he kept a, literally a daily diary of of the process of it. Oh my God, that's such a great and, idea! I've got to steal it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. And he, even in the first entry, he says something like, "Oh, I've never had much luck with keeping." a diary because 
I just, uh, the, the pressure of it was too much, but now I feel that it's essential to the work. And he saw it as a kind of self-discipline. But what struck me about that is, about that book, the, the journals book, uh, which is that he, so Great to Rap came out of, he was originally, so he witnessed this lettuce, lettuce growers strike in California that became really violent. And there was, people were literally murdered in the streets of his hometown. And he was very moved by it. He was uh, in his mid thirties and very idealistic. And his wife, Carol, uh, had these very sort of leftist views and they, they were both into sort of social justice and all of that. And so he, after the lettuce strike, he was commissioned to write this book called The Lettuce Affair or something like that. And he... What a horrible name, actually. <laughs> it, it was in French, actually. Um, the, I don't remember exactly the, the name of it, but it was... Uh, oh, Le Faire Lettuceburg, I think <laughs> it was called. Um, but uh, when he finished, so this is to me the most extraordinary thing, and it, it, and that's what shows so much about personhood is that when he finished that manuscript, he wrote a letter to his editor and he said, this is going to be a very hard letter to write. And he basically said, the book is finished and it's a bad book and I have to destroy it because, and it was, it was supposed to be this sort of satire, um, basically eviscerating the people, the workers, the people involved in the government and just sort of very much uh, based w- based on sort of negative reinforcement to express any sort of social justice views, but through the negative side. And he said, um, I-, "I can't do it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna turn it in." And please understand. Uh, and he said, "If I can do better, I have slipped badly." That I remember. He said that term, like I have slipped badly. If I can do better than this, and so he destroyed it. And and that was um, a few. Uh, I think. Three weeks later, he had started writing Grace of Rap, which had the, the sort of opposite approach to the same topic. It was very much about um, just giving people the dignity of their experience, you know? It's almost like the Grapes of Wrath was a, was a rewrite of his first... It was a rewrite, but it was a rewrite. It was a mirror world hmm. rewrite where he, he... It was the same subject, but, but it was a different... Um, I guess, quality of, of, of intention to it. And I admire that so much that the ability to say, not only I'm going to kill my darlings, but also I was wrong and I can do better. I can do better. I can put something into the world. That's not just informative and, and sort of entertaining in its very intelligent cynicism, but something that is good and that is kind and that it still makes a point a very important political and social point but it doesn't do it in a way that tears people down and 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 leaves readers hopeless because that was another thing that he wrote uh, in that letter to his editor saying that i can put a book out that will basically depress people so much and not give them a sense of of, of an alternative and of, of of what there is to do but only of what is wrong what, what strikes me also as interesting is the patience in that so everybody Says, you know, I get tons of emails um, that, that say something to the effect of, I'm 27 years old. I feel like a failure because I haven't found my passion in life. And mm-hmm. it always strikes me that, you know, life is not about having w- one or two or 50 passions. Life's not really about passion at all, but it's about kind of taking these experiences and just being patient with it, being present with it, and and doing the best you can with it. And it sounds like that's what he did by saying, okay, I'm going to take my time on this and do it right. Yeah, yeah. And I I think you're absolutely right about the presence aspect, because it's not just about being patient and sitting back and sort of waiting for your life to manifest. But, you know, I was was listening to your um, conversation with Jimmy Wales, whom I love. I just love what he stands for in the world, you know? And he said something about... Um, about why Wikipedia, you know, picked up. He said something like, oh, you know, it allows people to do something useful with their time. And yes, I agree. People do hunger to do something useful with their time in our age of uselessness. You know, there's so much distraction and just crap. But I would also say there's something more, which is that people also hunger to do something ennobling with their time. And this is something that can't be quantified you know there's no utilitarian value to it the way that there is with what we call usefulness 
but I do deeply believe that people people want to be good. Like we want to be good. We want to do better, which requires that we grow and that we enrich and ennoble ourselves and our, our, our souls. And by the way, the, it's interesting that this word soul has become one of the greatest targets of cynicism and eye rolling and, oh, you know, but very few things, you know, very few things today elicit more cynicism than that word upon being uttered yet are imbued with deeper longing upon being privately beheld when we think about our souls. Like, that is the, the 27 year olds writing to you saying, I want to find my purpose. That's somebody basically saying, I want to do work that gratifies and fulfills my soul. But we're so afraid to even acknowledge that, that, that we just don't go after it. I think that's very true. I think often, often with my own writing, I try to skirt that word. I go around that word while still um, trying to help people figure out how to find or how at least I found that part of myself. Because when you use words like soul or God or spiritual, then everybody's going to bring their own baggage to the table. And then suddenly there's so much baggage, it just fills up the room and, and, and you lose track of, of, of what's yeah. really there. Well, it's a semantic problem too, though, because I I, I think I mean I, I personally don't um, don't think soul is a spiritual term. I I am not religious. Um, don't bring any of that baggage, you know, myself. But I don't mean it in the sense of you know eternal soul and in, in the sort of Christian and other traditions, but more this little. Um, just our, our 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 participation, I guess, in the mystery of life that 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 is inside each of us, and um, it's a very secular thing in terms of just our sense of who we are and who we want to be, and the gap between those, and just the presence that we bring to every day of our lives. I guess that is what a soul is. Well, and it's interesting. I think with Google, you know, or, or basically with the internet, uh, you have all the world's information at your fingertips. But at the same time, you don't, it's harder, it becomes harder in some sense to find those things that, you know, really light you up and, and excite you. And I think, mm -hmm. and again, getting back to the, the origin of, of brain pickings, I think that's what you were finding in these three, four, five things a day you were sending out. Um, these were the things that were exciting to you, that were, that, you know, were lighting up the the mystery of your soul to some extent so that you mm. can share it with others. And so, so, so again, getting back to that story, what, what happened? Like how, what happened next? So eventually I realized that the, the tiny little emails that I was sending to my friends at work, they were forwarding to friends of theirs and people would say, Oh, you know, my girlfriend or my college roommate, like really liked this. And I thought, all right, well, if, it sounds like it's helpful to other people that this record of my own journey of my own sort of becoming a person is marginally useful to other people. Why not just make it public? And that was before, at least to my completely incompetent mind, I think that was before blogs were very pervasive. And, you know, I, at the time, I just didn't know, I didn't think to put it on a blog. And I think the only real platform WordPress had just launched blogger existed, but it wasn't, it didn't have features that were appealing enough to, to bother with, I guess. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to take a night class, which was in addition to my, you know, college course load and the four jobs and whatever. And I, I'm going to just teach myself a little bit of code so I could make my own site and uh, just start putting those little bulletins, you know, on, on that site. And I did that. And eventually, but it was literally hard coding an HTML page every Friday, stripping off the old one, replacing with a new one, no CMS, no archive, no nothing. Um, so I did that for a while. And then I think it was in the summer of 07, I eventually learned about WordPress, like watched a whole bunch of tutorials, taught myself how to do it, migrated it. Um, my friend Chuck helped me. He was an IT guy. And that was that that was really kind of how it ended up on, on the web. And I just kept doing it from that point on. Now, one important thing, which I think we're all so much the product of uh, our time and place and the curveballs that we have no control over is that so I'm not an American citizen. And at the time, the when after I graduated college, 
I very reluctantly went through the whole sort of uh, recruiting thing just to see what would happen. And I got a bunch of offers from very, you know, standard uh, pen kid jobs and, you know, consulting and marketing and yada, yada. And I just, just did not, didn't want to do it. Just didn't want to do it. And I decided to stay with the agency in Philly and just build brain pickings and just do my own thing. And I had the sense of like, I don't need that much. What's the, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with whatever I have. Like I don't need to go earn these like giant salaries and go to cubicles all day, you know? And so the agency filed for a visa for me to, to be able to stay because after graduating, you get one year in what is called OPT, which means optical practical, optional practical training, uh, which means you're allowed to legally work in the country for one year in your field of study. So you get a job and, and then after that, the, your employer applies for a visa, for a real visa for you to stay for a longer period. So we did that, but that was unfortunately in the very unfortunate 07, uh, visa gate period, which was a giant uh, government glitch that affected two thirds of people who were in in the U.S. working with just totally legal visas and such, and um, it it ended up that that we applied, but we didn't. The application got turned away, not even opened, because the government the 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 way that the visa gate thing happened is it basically this is so boring. But I don't, even, short, I don't even know about visa gate. I never heard of this. <laughs> well, that's what they nicknamed it. But I think on Wikipedia now, it's you can find it under that, I'm pretty sure. But Or at some point you could. Um, every year at the time, the situation was such that the government gave 65,000 H-1B work visas to people applying to work for employers. H-1B is the kind of visa that a company gets for you if you're a foreigner. Um, and usually the application period would run from April 1st to October 1st, but in the first two weeks of April, the quota would get filled up. So basically, you have to apply on the first day if you want a shot at it. Now, 2007 was it some sort of complete anomaly that on the very first day that applications were being accepted, which was April 2nd, because the first was a Sunday, uh, the government got 180,000, so three times the quota on the first day, and they panicked because there is no fair system to do it. So they turned it into a lot. So if you applied after the first day, you're automatically rejected. If you applied on the first day, it was turned into a lottery where one out of three got even opened to be reviewed. Oh, my gosh. And ours got mailed back. It just was not in that lot even to be reviewed. And so I had to... Uh, <laughs> leave the country, like pack up the entire life that I had and all my books and things and, and just leave. And I went on this sort of forced sabbatical, almost like an exile for a little over a year. I went uh, to Bulgaria where I was from and sort of split my time between there and London because I was doing a little bit of writing for Wire UK at the time. And I, I was just so unhappy and I felt so uprooted and disappointed. And But the, the only reason I'm mentioning this is that actually, and I think there is very often a silver lining in these um, less than ideal circumstances that are forced upon us, that sabbatical, because Bulgaria, living in Bulgaria was so much cheaper, you know, it was really, really cheap to, to rent and, and live there, that I was, and I was doing my a, a bit of freelance work with the agency still remotely, and also writing for Wired and a little bit for Business Week and whatnot, that I was actually able to have a pretty relaxed life for a few months where I really wanted to think about brain pickings and just do that. And I had more time to read. And even though I had no access to books, because that was before Kindle and all of that, and nobody would ship actual books to Bulgaria. So uh, <laughs> it was kind of a comical situation. That's when I started reading a lot of the public domain texts like Aristotle and older things that I could get for free, you know, on the Internet, just as an electronic text. Uh, but in any case, so those few months were actually very, while very unhappy, they were very fruitful. And I guess that's a common thread in, in the <laughs> origin story that I, I started brain pickings out of being very unhappy as a sophomore in college for many reasons. And then I really, really built it out when I was in this state of just helpless dejection you know if anything this was like the one consistent thing happening in your life was that every i don't know if you were doing every day at that point but every certain amount of times you were you were updating brainpickings.org yeah yeah i mean i actually when i moved to bulgaria uh is when i started doing it every day so originally it was just the friday email newsletter put on the web so it would be just 
just on Fridays. But when I moved, I spread it out over the week. So instead of like three or five short things all on Friday, I would do them one day, one per day, you know, and And yeah. So, so, so at this point, how many users per, per month were you getting? Oh, I had no idea. I wasn't even, Hmm. or maybe I think I learned about Google analytics that year when I was in Bulgaria, when I was very, I guess I was very interested in how the web works. So I was reading all these sort of sites about the technical stuff, which was never my forte or my interest really, but I had all this time and I was just learning about the web and, uh, I don't, let me see, let me think. I mean, I do remember one day when I, so BrainFigures at that point was on WordPress and WordPress had its own stats that just when you log in to write, it would show you like the stats. Um, I I do remember one day when I had something like uh, a thousand readers a day, or maybe it was even a hundred readers in, in one day. A big milestone I, for any blogger. I know. And I was like, oh my God, it's not just the guys anymore. You know, my seven, the seven guys at work. <laughs> it was so funny. And I also remember in 2008, maybe or nine, when I got my hundredth Twitter follower and I started in my Gmail because I was at the time still getting the notifications in my email. It was like some random person that I didn't know. And I just remember thinking, you know, there are people out there. There are people that just share in this this sensibility and this sort of hope the the hope that i feel when i when i that i come out of when i read and when i write so so that's exciting and i think that's when it becomes more than just writing for yourself when there's a realization that there there's other people out there who are not only grateful and thankful for what you're writing but they're also maybe dependent on it that's why they're following you mm yeah, I mean, it, it's it's an interesting line and it's a fine line. And I think any writer, yeah, I think any writer who says, oh, I don't write for an audience is either delusional or just deliberately, you know, in, in, in denial or lying to ourselves. But uh, as soon as you have an awareness of an audience, of course, that's a thing. That's a presence. There's some form of an other, you know, somebody other than you just present looking on and where it gets kind of hairy is that at what point do you tip over from this kind of, I guess, shared solitude, which is what it can be and which I try to have it be for me into a form of people pleasing, which the awareness of the audience, so-called, you know, the sort of aggregate and what they might want or what they might like, that can be very addictive because I think as, Humans were very um, were very Pavlovian creatures. We thrive on constant positive reinforcement, and we, especially now, when I do know how to use stats now, and I do, and I have a Facebook page, I have a Twitter page. Like we can get statistics very easily on how we're doing because that's really what we want to know. You know, when you post something on Facebook and you're sort of looking at how many people liked it, it's like that little insecure little child in you saying. Am I okay? Am I doing okay? Like, how am I doing? You know, and it's totally it's like, like if, if I post something on Facebook and it doesn't get the engagement that I want it to get, I am personally crushed. Yeah. So even though, but I, like you say, it's a line. Like I also don't want to write to just please others. I want to write something that I feel is good. And so there is a, a, a fine line. So, so, okay. So, so you went from a hundred, then a thousand, then 10,000 users how many user? How many unique visitors did you have last month? Um, I have not actually logged into Google Analytics in a long time, but WordPress tells you. I think page views is the stat that it gives you, and it's around which are, is different from unique, right? It's like just the hits, I guess. Right. Uh, I have around eight million a month. I would say. So yeah. so so basically. So from 100 to 8 million, and I, I... But I would say it's fewer uniques, I would imagine. It's like yeah. no more oh, than a third of that or a half or who knows. I mean, I can easily look it up. Well, well, I would say it's less than that because your site is totally... It's like sure, Alice... You know what? I am going to look it up as we speak. It's like Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole because once you get into one article, you have like five links to other articles and I could spend an hour going from like article to article on your site because now you have such a, a wide body of, of work in there. Mm, but, well, that interface looks so different than last time I looked. Okay, so here's what Google Analytics says. 
uh, yeah, the page views are the page views, and then it says users three million five hundred ninety three eight hundred and eighty. I mean that's so you're you're basically living the American dream. So <laughs> you're living the Bulgarian dream. Oh, uh, I'm turn that, phone that off. sounded like Bulgarian folk music. Actually, it was very timely. I, I, yes, I have specifically a, a library of Bulgarian folk music for my <laughs> cell phone signals. But uh, it's amazing. Basically, it's like Craigslist. Like Craig sent out, you know, Craig Newmark sent out a list of his favorite places in San Francisco every week. And the next thing you know, we have Craigslist. And and this is how he, you know, will spend his life and, and make his living. So you you have basically achieved the American dream of you totally did exactly what you wanted to do. And you had some strife and, and hardship along the way. But you came out the other side, and now it's just amazing. You 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 have these three million unique visitors. They 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 look to what you write, and you get to you know one way or other, you get to make a living off of it. So so I assume you make a living in part through donations, and part through affiliate fees, and mm-hmm. it's just great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I've been very very grateful just to see that unfold, and 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 just take off, which is not something I ever ever like planned on. I, I found out about the Amazon affiliates. I, when I was actually, I think it was the last month in Bulgaria and I was reading Jason Kotke's site and I clicked on some uh, link to a book and it opened in the browser and the URL, it had like question mark Kotke 20. And I was like, how did his name get in the Amazon URL? That's like so weird. And so of course I Googled it. I found out about it. Um, so, but Interestingly, the Amazon stuff for a while was comparable to the donations, and now it's so many times smaller. I mean, the donations are really, it's wonderful, and people are very, very generous, and uh, it's been very interesting to observe it. And and uh, so I, so last year you wrote uh, an article, seven, seven Lessons from Seven Years of Doing Brain Pickings, and I kind of wanted to, to go through some of the lessons that you've learned. Uh, like you list the first one as allow yourself the uncomfortable luxury of changing your mind. Mm. And what, what, what did you mean by that? In part, I meant, I guess, what Steinbeck did with his novel, right? <laughs> so this notion of stepping back and saying, okay, well, it's more important for me to understand and reflect and, and recalibrate what I want to stand for than to be right and to feel right. Which is and such if, a, such a way, different, that's such a different view than, so for instance, I used to write a lot in the financial space and nobody is allowed to change their mind mm. or, or no, if you go on like CNBC, for instance, and you say the words, I don't know, then you're never going on CNBC again. Mm. Well, yeah, no, I, that, that's very much part of the culture that we're in. But I also should say that I, Th- that piece that the seven learnings that as I, I think I wrote that in the introduction is that uh, it's not a sort of holier than thou just how you should live my your life but more of these are the things that I still struggle with but they're the ones that I identify as the most important daily practice to come back to and remind yourself of you know and so it's not like I've mastered that I hate being wrong I really hate being wrong you know <laughs> but but I welcome it and I just sort of grumble through it and which is why one of the journalists that I admire most and he's become a good friend and I feel an enormous kinship of story with him in a number of different ways is Andrew Sullivan who very famously changed his mind about the Iraq war many years ago and and I think he is one of the very few consistently sort of committed journalists who, who, I mean, he has been doing this. He's been one of the world's first bloggers and an amazing editor at the nation and then the Atlantic and the daily beast and now independent for, for more than a decade. And he is just very dedicated to doing that and, and to, to just showing up for, for what he does and, and constantly reassessing and, and, and he publishes dissents. So readers who sort of disagree with his comments, he publishes that on the site without sort of commenting to tear them down or just sort of saying, Hey, this is the alternative, uh, alternative opinion, alternative view. And I have so much respect for that. 
Yeah, that is, that is interesting. I haven't. I have to check out his his site more. Uh, as I said, I don't look at any site but your site. So I. Um... Mm. Well, I recommend the dish. Yeah, it is. He is. Uh, he now has a staff, a small small staff, and they're also ad free. So he left the Daily Beast was the last gig he had, and two years ago, I think he just started doing it independently and supported solely through memberships. That's you know? great. And yeah. then um, you say something your, – your next thing that you say on this list is something that so many of my guests on the podcast have said and and also meets so much resistance from people who have a hard time with this. But it's do nothing for prestige or status or money or approval alone. And I'll tell you the last person to say that to me was Coolio the rapper. <laughs> So oh, you, I have not so, listened to that episode yet. I have to hunt that down. So, so you and Coolio have that in common. He would write every day for 17 years before he had his first hit. Mm. So, so that takes a lot of – he uh, he said he wasn't doing it for anything other than that he loved doing it. And you, you, the proof is in the fact that it took 17 years to have a hit from it. Mm. Yeah, I mean I, I I very much believe that. And even the notion of a hit – it, that's almost uh, – it's not the goal that you work towards. It's, it's the silver lining of having gone through the experience that generated. And it actually this week, uh, Princeton, Princeton University released a very big archive of um, Einstein's papers. And I was sort of poking through and digging, and I found a letter that he wrote to a colleague. And uh, he sort of talks about the buffoonery. He says the whole buffoonery of the scientific establishment and all the awards and all the sort of pompous crap. And he says to the, the other man, who was a friend of his, a Swiss professor at the University of Zurich, he says, you still have the rewards of doing the work he loves. You know, and that's, that's sort of, that's enough. That's, that's the real that's the real honor. Well, th- this is like a thread through a lot of Einstein's letters, which, of course, I've read, which I, I only know because I've read them on your site. So <laughs> I-, I recently sent to my two daughters um, a part of the letter that Einstein sent to his son, which I read on your site. And the, mm. the part was That's a beautiful letter. I- yeah. I- I'm the- he says specifically, I- I'm very pleased that you find joy with the piano. This and carpentry are, in my opinion, <laughs> for your age, the best pursuits, better even than school. And I like that because do if you if you do what you find joy in, that's how you're going to truly succeed. That's how you're going to make money. That's how you're going to find success. However you whatever metric you use to judge that, and that's better than even than school because there's all this research that even shows if you go to a lecture that you're bored with, 45 minutes later you're going to totally forget it. You won't be able to answer one question about it. Mm-hmm. And it's so true. Uh, I went on one podcast where the podcaster had majored. I think at the same school that, that you went to, uh, uh, he had majored in European history. And so I asked him, well, OK, let me ask you one question. When was Charlemagne born? And, uh, you know, the most important uh, probably figure in European history. And, well, I would argue that's Voltaire, but OK, go on. OK, fair enough. But, uh, you know, he kind of united Europe for a brief period, Charlemagne. So, so anyway, um, he was – he was 700 years off in his guess. And this is someone who majored in it in college, which – and this doesn't say anything bad about him. It's about kind of the, the institution of higher education is not really where people go to, to learn um, what's important to them. But we're still talking here about information and facts, which are very different from wisdom. And I personally – can't recall the date that he was born, nor do I really care to, because I think if that person that you spoke with was actually able to, in addition to that, or instead of that, tell you what was important about that period in history and how different people related to one another and how all of that sort of percolated through um, the world and world history and how it explains this or that and that. And I, I do think that one thing that's happening with the web is that it's lowering and or completely displacing the need for um, absolute knowledge of facts and and making us better at or encouraging a kind of relational knowledge, which is how facts relate to one another and explain one another, because you can very easily retrieve the fact. You know, we now don't remember the facts. We remember the retrieval pathways to them. So, you know, I know to go to Wikipedia or biography.com or whatever and look that up. Uh, but wisdom to me is the more important thing, which is how do bits of information fit together to 
create a framework of knowledge, which then we assess and reflect on and contemplate to extract some sort of moral wisdom about not just what is true in the world, not just how the world works, but also how it should work and how it could work. And to me, that's the more interesting thing. Right. And I think, I think many forms of education don't teach, don't teach that. They, they test you on the facts. They don't test you on mm -hmm. the wisdom. Yeah. But, yeah. but then that's why, again, I like a site like yours because look at number three of your seven lessons, which is be generous. So this is, this is after you've read hundreds or thousands of books and, and written all of these articles. This is the third lesson from your seven years. Um, and that, of course, is, you know, what sits on top of, you know, all of these things that you've read and all these things that you've written. The lesson is be generous with your time, with your resources, you know, with yourself, with your words. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think. And, and then you say, I just want to say, and then you say it's so much easier to be a critic than a celebrator. And I think that's a key word, particularly in today's day and age of outrage porn that happens on the internet. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that is foundational to, to what I believe and what we talked about earlier in terms of cynicism and earnestness and what kinds of emotions we think are permissible and, and what kinds are embarrassing to have. And, you know, Austin, Austin Cleon, he has this really great line um, in his first book, I think, which is still like an artist, where he says, be kind, the world is a small village, you know, and it, it's true. And it's not, I don't mean that, or I don't know how he means it, but I don't read that as a transactional thing of, oh, I'm going to be nice to you so you can be nice to me. And, and I think being nice and being kind are very different things. I, I, I think the world is a small town in the sense that we, we touch people all the time with our interactions with them. And it's always a choice in what way to do it. And it takes so little to make somebody's day. You know, it takes so little to, to, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I get really lovely notes from readers and somebody, you know, took time out of their day to brighten mine. And, and it's such a gift, but it also takes so little to crap on somebody's day. And the unfortunate thing about, human psychology, or perhaps my psychology, but I think it's true of a lot of people, is that one snarky comment from somebody on a stranger on Facebook who has not even read the article can really, really bring you down to a point where 10 earnest, generous emails from people who thought about something and paused and reached out just don't don't count as much, you know, and it's it's very unfortunate. And I think that too, as a constant practice internally to, to be a, not a self critic, but to some degree, a self celebrator just for the preservation of sanity. I don't mean in terms of uh, being arrogant, but just sort of keeping yourself somewhat sane. Yeah. So, so, uh, it's difficult because, you know, so I have a bunch of books out there. I could get 10 good reviews in a row and then one, one star review. And of course, that's probably the right ratio, 10 to 1. The one-star review would totally, you know, no matter what, it's, yeah. a, it's a psychological yeah. thing. Like I could, I could, you know, do all sorts of self-work and, and meditate and think about things. But still, when someone presses the right button, it's going to affect me. Now, it'll affect me less and less, but then there's another button that I wasn't aware of. Mm. And another person will stumble upon that button by accident and press it. And there's almost no way to, to avoid that other than to realize, okay, uh, other to acknowledge that that's happened and I can't let it, I, I have to learn how to better and better react to it. Yeah. And, and, and I think the other thing too is that the criticism that burns the most is not the people who disagree and dissent after having reflected and just have a different opinion, but the people who misunderstand who yes. misunderstand you, misunderstand it. your motive, misunderstand what you're saying, because then you feel a sense of helplessness almost, because there's nothing really to counter that with. You already made your point clear. They just were not, didn't, didn't take the time to even see that. They just had a reaction as opposed to a response. You know, have you ever thought of doing like a quarterly box? You know, one of those things where... I, I did a quarterly box. The very first, that was one of the... I was, I think, the second or third contributor. I did it for a year. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. What, 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 um, why did you stop? 
it was too much time. And I, because I am not a believer in sort of half assery, you know, and I think if I can full asset, I, I would rather not do it at all. And I, the I like very that first, <laughs> the very, uh, yeah, very non, non, uh, well, what, 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 but, but, but the first package that I sent was a book that I really liked, uh, called sounds for letters, shapes for sounds, which is a visual history of the alphabet. And the mistake that I made, of course, was that I hand annotated it with sticky notes, like dozens of them, and, and wrote essentially analog hyperlinks on, onto the book to why this part is important and what else it relates to. And I, it took exactly as much time as you would imagine. And after I did that first one, I thought, I don't want to do anything less than that. I don't want to settle for some sort of mediocre trinket thing. And so after the first year, I just realized that if I were to do it to the standards that I, I, I like, to, to basically, um, if I were to, receive, to be the recipient of that, the kind of stuff that I would like to receive is the kind of stuff that I would like to give, which is also how I approach my, my writing, then that would take so much time that it would just not be sustainable. So, 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 yeah. you, so and, and, you know, I, I can relate to that because you um... – you write so much every day and I'm sure you want every article to be as best as possible. And sometimes it's hard to kind of do more than one. It's hard to do more than one activity where you want all of those activities to be as best as they can possibly be. And I, I dealt with this a little with podcasting because I enjoy my writing very much, but also now I enjoy this podcasting very much. And I try to make, I try to deliver the highest amount of value in both. But mm, what, which you do, what, hmm? and I don't mean this in a sort of a suck puppy way, but I get as much stimulation out of the show as out of the books and in a very different way, which I think is also important. I think for me, I've kind of combined them, which is that, uh, uh, first off, the reading, the, the podcasting encourages me to read a lot. So, so let's say it's either you or whoever I'm having on, like I just had on, uh, Adam Grant, I interviewed earlier this morning. Mm. So it means I have I, I read his his book, Give and Take, but then I also go through his TEDx talks, and it gives me exposure to a lot of things that maybe I would have or wouldn't have read. So so, but but I chose to interview him because I was interested in the topic, and so it gives me kind of crash courses in lots of different ideas. But I'll do the mm -hmm. same thing with my writing as well because I'll make I always have to read like several hours before I could start writing. Uh, do, do you do the same? I think you do do the same or similar. Yeah, I mean, the writing is just sort of, the reading is the real work. And, and it's not just sort of reading, but reading and thinking and reading and having some sort of um, discriminating um, it's sort sense of, like, of what matters and why. Right, it's sort of like something has to, uh, you read and you read and you read, and it's like sort of rubbing sticks together until something catches fire. Oh, that's such a wonderful metaphor. I love it. Yeah, yeah, and on that note, I should get back to lighting the fire for the day well, sometime ab soon. <laughs> absolutely, and I don't want to keep you from it. Tell me, tell me just what some of your favorite books are, because that's what I really want to get out of this entire hour. Oh, wait a minute. That is an ambush question. It you is know, an I ambush feature, question. I like, 10 books a week for eight years. <laughs> Do I the know. math. So that's why I didn't ask um, what's your one I favorite book. I can tell you what, what some favorites at the moment are because, again, we're Perfect. constantly evolving. Um, there's a book by a cognitive scientist named Alexandra Horowitz who studies uh, dogs and dog behavior, but she wrote a book last year called 11 Walks with Expert Eyes where she uh, takes a walk along a single city block with 11 different so-called experts from a an, an artist to a blind woman, a, a physician, her dog, and, and sort of records, compares and contrasts their individual perception of reality. So how that expert on one walk sees the world differently from the way she does. And of course, they see it in profoundly different ways. And the whole point of the book is that uh, we are so limited by our experience and our knowledge. And what we call reality is really this very narrow slice of interpretation of the world 
and, and it's it's a, and she's also a phenomenal writer. So it's it's both very pleasurable to read and very very pause giving. And I I think you wrote about this, right? I remember I remember many you, times. It's, I, yeah. I I have come back to this book so many times, and I've actually subsequently gotten to know Alexandra through strangely. I met her at a our mutual friend Susan Orlean had a house party, and it turned out that Alexandra was her neighbor, and it was this like weird you know confluence of. Uh, sort of circles, you know, intersecting, but, uh, yeah, but the book is fantastic. And, and then another one would be, I mean, pretty much anything by Rebecca Solnit really. Uh, but the far away nearby, is really good. Um, my favorite one of hers actually is a field guide to getting lost, which is a collection of essays about, uh, I guess how we orient ourselves to the world and to ourselves and to others and, She's she's a really great great essayist and just thinker. Oh, I'm gonna get that. And an older one that I, that is always a standby, and I literally reread it all the time is Seneca's On the Shortness of Life, which is coincidentally a short book. Uh, it's great. Um, Henry David Thoreau's Diaries, the journal. The, I think it's called the journal because you know back in the day men journaled and women kept diaries. <laughs> uh, but um, that that's always rewarding and the same with Ann Truitt's day book, the artist Ann Truitt, which is her journal or diary. Right? She calls it day book, I guess, neither journal nor diary. Um, how many, how many are we going for here? Really? <laughs> uh, you can keep going because I'm writing them all down. I'll, I'll, tell, <laughs> I'll tell you what, what I've read going it's down your book. Shop. Uh, a little bit of a, of a selfish. Pause. Well, 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 I'll tell you what I've read on uh, that, that, I found through your site, actually. So um, one is pro- probably most of Anne Lamott's books you've you've written oh, about, like yeah. Bird by Bird and the more recent one, um, Small Victories. Uh, Amanda Palmer's Ar- Art of Asking, I really enjoyed. Uh, the Art of Stillness, I really enjoyed. Uh, anything by Joan Didion, I like. I, I was reading, uh, I don't know how to say her name, I Anais Nin's Diaries on your recommendation. Um, I've read a lot of books on your recommendation, actually. Uh, Sam Harris, who I've had on my podcast, is Waking Up. Uh, oh, that was a really good show. That was one of my favorites of, of your entire archive that I've listened to. Was, Sam is just so just articulate and just, you know perceptive in, in many different very directions. Very smart guy, yeah. yeah. And... Um, I don't know. I th- I highly recommend people go down your whole list. You know, I had read this earlier, uh, and then you recommended it later. But Paul Graham's book, uh, Hackers and Painters, I thought it's a very good, beautiful book. Uh, Still writing by Danny Shapiro. Oh uh, yeah, I really that, love. That one I would highly. That will be at least in my top five in in recent years. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know it's weird. I like these books. The um, this is Dolly and this is Warhol. They're like easy books to read about art, and I I really enjoy that that whole series. Mm, uh, they also, they just came out with um, Jackson Pollock. I, I I I bought that one and read it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, but another yeah. one that I would recommend again is sort of a standby packet of of wisdom on many different things is uh. Well, there are two of them, George O'Keefe's letters, and one is the volume of her letters to her best friend, Anita Pulitzer. Uh, and the other one is, it, it was a companion book published in the 90s uh, to, a, to a George O'Keefe retrospective, and it's called Art and Letters, George O'Keefe, Art and Letters. Uh, oh, I'll but, check those but out. But she's yeah. quite the philosopher in terms of being a phenomenal artist. So... so- I really appreciate you coming on. I know you're really busy, so I'll I'll, I'll let you get back to work. You write th- three or four articles a day, so I know what that's like. <laughs> it's it's hard. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This was just such a great conversation, and uh, thank you for putting things into the world that are hope giving. Yes, yeah, and you too. Well, thanks very much, Maria. I'll talk All to right, you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today.
AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.